everybody. This is Mike Benz. He's going to be talking about Taming ETS. Give it up! Well, I guess that's where, where we're going. So, um, uh, like I said, my name is Mike Benz. This is Taming, this is Taming Etz. Uh, before we dive in, uh, those any of you out there that have kids know that kids are uh, great. I have four boys, and they oftentimes like to be helpful, right? Uh, you know, those of you that are, that are laughing understand the air quotes because uh, it's not always helpful. Uh, my boys are not with me on this trip, however, uh, this morning, uh, my my body decided to be helpful, like like my kids, and he, and it said, you know, you have this. I know you have this talk at, at eleven fifteen in the morning, and I want to make sure that you don't sleep through that talk. So I'm going to wake you up at four forty five, and make sure you don't sleep through that talk, uh, which it did. And don't worry if you try to fall, you know, try to fall back asleep. I got your back. I won't let you fall back asleep. So uh, for the speakers, other speakers, if you see me yawning in the back, that's why. It's not a, it's not a reflection on your, your talks. So anyway, Taming Etz, uh, quick uh, agenda, what we're going to do today, a quick intro, discuss some of the basics of Etz, and then get into some pitfalls of Etz, and then we're going to discuss an Etz uh, wrapper library. Just so you know, in here, uh, if you see the... Uh, colon underscore or colon lowercase ets. We're talking about the Erlang library, and ETA ets uh, capital. That's talking about the wrapper library. And so you'll see that throughout the presentation. Uh, myself, uh, my name is Mike Benz. As I said, I've been writing Elixir since 2014. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Dockyard, uh, and I'm currently the lead Dockyard engineer on the Cars.com project. Uh, if you were at ElixirConf. Uh, this past year, you saw our talk on that. If you haven't seen it, uh, yeah, definitely check it out. Socials are up there. I have a number of uh, open source Elixir libraries, including uh, Project Iron Man and then ETS, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, I would like to thank Dockyard for sponsoring me uh, to, to attend Lone Star Elixir. Uh, Dockyard is a design and development consultancy that helps com companies build new apps and provide senior level staff augmentation and architecture review services. We also offer Elixir training services for companies interested in, level, interested in leveling up their teams in Elixir. So if your company is interested in diving into Elixir, come see me or check us out on dockyard.com. So to frame this talk, uh, ETS is an amazing tool and there's awesome things out there, things that you can do with it. Uh, if you haven't used it before, you should look, uh, take, uh, take a look and try it out. Um, while there are a great many talks, blog posts, and tutorials out there about ETS and how to use it and what you can do with it, uh, this talk is not one of them. This talk is different in that I'm going to try to lay a foundation for you to be successful in uh, diving into ETS by explaining some of the common pitfalls that people encounter with ETS, or at least the, the pitfalls that I ran into when I was, I was learning it, and then uh, introduce a library that could hopefully help you with that. So uh, before we get into pitfalls, I need to give a quick primer on ETS uh, for those of you that haven't used it before. But I'm only going to cover what's necessary for you to understand the pitfalls that I'm going to uh, talk about in a bit. This is not a comprehensive uh, explanation of ETS. So uh, how many of you out there have used ETS in production? Show of hands. All right, cool. How many of you have used it at all, even, not even just in production? Great. Um, and uh, how many of you have ever been frustrated by an argument error that uh, gave you no context as to why it was happening? All right, good, good. So hopefully this will this will resonate. So what is ETS? ETS is the Erlang term storage. It, it allows you to store very large quantities of data in the Erlang runtime in memory with constant access time to that data. That data is stored in dynamic tables each table is created by and tied to a process. Uh, when the owning process dies, the table dies. So it follows the Erlang process model there. There are three protection levels for a table tied to the processing process that it was created by. A private 
that table can only be read from and written to by the process that created it. A protected uh, table can be read from any process but only written to from the process that created it. And a public uh, table can be read from and written to by uh, any process. Uh, so an Annette's table is just a list, list of tuples. Uh, each record that you insert uh, adds a single tuple to that list. So for example, an Annette's table with three records would look like this. As you can see, we've inserted those records in the form ID, email, first, last, and uh, state. Note that there is no protection on ETS as far as uh, these what you're inserting. So you can insert any size record, and that can vary in the same table. So you can insert a record with one item, then insert a record with five. There's no you have to know about that when you're when you're uh, working with it. Each table defines a one indexed key position. Uh, by default, that key position is one, and what that means is that. In this example up here, by if I was using the default key position of one, I want to find look up a record. I would call ets.lookup on the table and pass in 42 for me. If I had set the key position to two, I would have to look up records based on email address. So there's four different types of tables that you can uh, use in ets: uh, two bags and two sets, and the difference between the, t the two bags and the two sets is that your sets are going to only allow you to have one value for a given key. So in here, in this uh, top example, we insert two records with the same key, uh, key position being one. Uh, when we do a lookup, we only get one back because the second one has overwritten the first one. A bag allows you to insert multiple records with the uh, same key. When you do a lookup, you'll get all of those back. Now, each of the bags and the sets has a, a modification version, a sister version. Uh, and for the bag, that's a duplicate bag. And so, while well, I mentioned before, a bag can uh, allow you to have multiple records with the same key. A duplicate bag can, a can also allow you to have multiple records with the exact same record in it. A regular bag and not duplicate bag will deduplicate that. So if you insert exactly the same record, three times, do a lookup, you're only going to get one back. Now the sister version of the set is the ordered set. And the ordered set, uh, there are four functions in ETS, uh, first, last, next, and previous, that allow you to iterate through the table by order of the keys. So if you notice, uh, we inserted C, A, B. Uh, first is A, it's, order, it's, the, it's the order of the key and not the order of, of insertion. Uh, so first on uh, the table is A, last is C, next for A is B, uh, next for B is C, and previous for C is B. Uh, one thing to note is that because of how ETS interface works, uh, you can pass any table in to, the, to these four functions. But if you pass in a table that's not a ordered set, it will give you a return value, and that value will be in the table, but you're not guaranteed any sort of uh, understanding of what uh, uh, order. So there's no protection to say, hey, you tried this on a not ordered set. So. All right, so challenge, Ra uh, raise your hand if you think that you could create a private ETS set with a key position to compression and write concurrency both enabled without looking at the docs. I'm sure, I'm sure some of you can. Uh, I know personally I can't, and the reason is that the options on ETS.new are not consistently formatted. The write concurrency and read concurrency, which are Boolean values, are specified in the options as uh, it, a two-option tuple. The compressed and named tables uh, values, which are bo also Boolean, are specified by either including the atom in the list of, of options or not including it. Uh, so here you see we're cr uh, creating a new table. We're passing in two Boolean options, but we have to specify them different, different ways. Uh, so as far as non-Boolean options, ones that have multiple values, uh, 
they are specified not by a key value pair, but by, the again, the presence of the atom for that option. So if you want to create a protected table, you're not saying protection protected, you're passing in the protected atom, similar for the, the type of table when you're specifying which table you're, you're, uh, you want to create. However, even though you specify them as an atom, when you go to look at that table, get the information back, it's coming back as a key value pair. So there's a, there's a disconnect there between how it's being specified and how it's uh, being returned. So here's an example of creating a new table. A uh, number of things to note. Uh, what type of table do we specify? Trick question. We didn't. We didn't actually specify one, and it uh, get, it set it as a set. Maybe that's a default. Maybe maybe not. But the fact that you don't have to explicitly say which type uh, to me is is something to be aware of. Uh, the compressed and named tables uh, again became boolean in the in the in output even though they're either specified or not in the input. Uh, did we specify this as a named table? The answer is no. So we, didn't, we did not pass in the named table value here. But does this table have a name? Yes, but no. Uh, it, it <laughs> so it has a name, but you cannot reference that table by that name. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, so then the question, and uh, so follow this, this, the, the syntax of the, the English syntax of the statement. Can we create multiple tables with the same name? The answer is only if they're not named tables. <laughs> right. So that just the 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 fact that that there's that that sort of uh, uh, syntax there should tell you that there's something not not great there. Uh, Another example, what type of table do, do we, are we creating here? Uh, answer, uh, answer is actually, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't actually try this. If my guess is a set, maybe there's some sort of ordering in that. Uh, however, the fact that you can specify this to me says, hey, there's, you know, there's, there's something there to be, to be aware of. When we get to looking up data in a table, uh, a couple of pitfalls to look out. For, uh, for one, you're, when you're doing a lookup, you're returning the full record. This is not a key value uh, lookup. Uh, that was a little confusing to me when I first started off. But you're going to get back the full, the full record. The second thing to note is that in this example, we're creating a set, right? And a set can only ever have one value for a key. But when we look up this value, we're not getting back that value. We're getting that back that value wrapped in a list. And if that value didn't exist, we would get back instead an empty list. So even though only you, the only real th options are an item or not an item, you need to, when you're doing pattern matching, you have to know that you're going to get something back no matter what, and you have to pattern match on either an empty list or destructure that one item out of the list. Uh, end of table. Uh, end of table is a fun part of uh, ETS. And what, it, what that is, is again, if we go back to our ordered set, we've inserted three items. If we call next on B, obviously we'll get C. But if we call next on C, we will get this atom end of table. Uh, and since the, the Erlang atom had a dollar sign in it, it has to be wrapped in quotes. So you get this fun colon, quote, dollar sign, end of table, quote, uh, that just doesn't look right. And if you, so if you say next on the last item in a table, you get end of table. And if you call pre uh, previous on the first item in a table, you'll get end of table, not beginning of table, end of table. A uh, fun thing to note is you can insert end of table as the key value into a table and then call next or previous and get that value back and you won't know if your <laughs> You won't know if you're halfway through the table and someone put end of table in there or <laughs> if you're actually at the end of the table. So uh, something to, to be aware of. Uh, yeah, that's, that w that's, that's a good one. Uh, let's see. All right, argument error. One of the most frustrating things about working with ETS is the argument error. 
uh, regardless of what goes wrong when you call an X function, you'll always, uh, if something goes wrong, you'll always get back an argument error with the message argument error and nothing else. <laughs> yep, that's it. Uh, so why did this call fail? Uh, there are, there were, oh, no. Uh, so there's four things that I could come up with that I thought of the reasons why this table could have, or this call could have failed. If the table, if my table doesn't exist, if it wasn't actually created, you'll get an argument error. The table is protected or private, and you're in a different process, you try to insert, argument error. If you try to insert an, an item, that is smaller than the key position, let's say you set the key position to three or four, and you insert a two, a size two record, argument error. If you, so if you're inserting multiple items and one of them is not actually a record, you know, if you're inserting less, each of them has to be a, a record. If one of them is just an atom, argument error. And all four of these will produce that exact same argument error. Uh, and there's no way to tell from that why, which one it is. So each one of these pitfalls taken individually may not be that big of a deal, but combined it makes ETS, the ETS experience less enjoyable than it, than it could be. And since every presentation needs a quote, I made one up. Uh, and <laughs> ETS is less fun to work with than it could be. I mean, that's a, the, the political way of saying it. Anyway, so let's get into the ETS wrapper library. Uh, one of the great things about working at Dockyard is, is we get Dockyard Fridays. So every Friday is dedicated to uh, non-client activities, uh, including contributing to open source. Uh, when I first was diving into ETS, I figured there had to be an Elixir wrapper for this to help with these issues. But I couldn't find one that looked like it was maintained and addressed the issues that I had listed. So I decided to create one myself. Uh, no one had claimed the ETS hex package name. So I grabbed that after making sure that wouldn't like break something uh, because it's the same as the, the name of the Erlang library. Uh, and over the next few months of Dockyard Fridays, ETS began to take shape. From a high level, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into each one of these in a second, uh, the ETS uh, wrapper splits tables in, into ETS.set and ETS.bag modules. All the functions, return OK value or error reason. It cleans up many of the interfaces with ETS, and most importantly, it determines the reason for argument errors. So as I mentioned, if you're using the ETS wrapper library, you're gonna be picking either a set or a bag. The ordered set becomes ordered true as, a flat, as a, uh, an option you pass in when you create the table on set, and similarly, duplicate bag becomes duplicate true on bag. This allows the interfaces on each of those modules to be tailored. So in, in a, if you're dealing with a set, instead of having to return uh, an empty list or a, a list with one item in it, we return the item or nil. Also, it allows us to be a little bit more clear on the insert. So if you're calling set.put, that will obviously override the item, so uh, that's that's what we called that, and bag.add, similarly you'll be adding it to the list of uh, items that you'll get back when you run that, or when you, when you look that up. The opts for new are now a proper keyword list. They, uh, this means no more single atoms in the list, so it doesn't break that, the syntactic sugar you can use for, for a keyword list. So for example, to create, to create a new ordered set with a name, right concurrency, compression, and private protection level, you would specify it like this up, up top. And you notice that these, uh, with the exception of uh, the type, the values that you're entering here match up with what you're gonna get back from the info. This info is simply uh, a pass through. We don't actually do any magic on that. We just pass that through. So now the, the actual ETS information matches what you entered. If you don't specify a name, then it doesn't create a name table. So you don't, it, uh, instead of always having to pass in a name as the first argument, that's gone and either you specify a name or you don't and you, there you, therefore you'll get a name table or you won't. Uh, so all functions contain two versions. 
uh, the regular version returns okay result or error reason, and then a bang version, which is great for, for uh, pipelines or maybe testing or whatever, that will return the result or it will raise. And that raise will contain that helpful version of the error message, uh, even though it's, it's, uh, it's an argument, or it's an error being raised, it's not the useless argument error. What this allows is a clean interface. Here, uh, a little bit of a contrived example, but if you were wanted to use a with statement, it's a nice clean uh, progression through, and your else will give you the error reason that you're dealing with, and you'll be able to handle those appropriately. Like I said, if you just want to use a test, you're in IEX, you just simply call set.new, uh, and you've, you're uh, good to go and s without having to remember all the different things that you have to pass in. So argument error. ETS tackles the argument error by determining what went wrong and returning the appropriate error reason tuple. Since the underlying, so the underlying ETS is all about speed, the way that I went about tackling this was not, uh, instead of running pre-checks to validate the information of the action you're trying to take, uh, we instead try rescue. So we run the checks only in the event that an argument error comes up. And this means that the happy path in the wrapper library has maintains the same performance as the underlying ETS uh, library. Here's a list of the errors that we can return. So, you know, table not found, table already exists. Uh, you notice that uh, the start of table and end of table are now uh, normal uh, or normal looking uh, atoms and we, deter we understand the difference between beginning of a table and end because that is important. And so as far as under the hood of ETS, this is, this is not something you'll need to know if you're going to use this library, but just, uh, just kind of show what's going on underneath. When you call set.put or bag.add, uh, in, in, on the internals it's going to call this base insert function. And what you can see is we try the ETS.insert and then we progressively work up through things that might have gone wrong if, if something go, does go wrong. So we'll first uh, try and see if the table is not found, then we'll see if the record was too small, uh, then we'll check to see if the table's right protected, and then finally we have a, you know, anything else goes wrong, we'll catch that and return, uh, I believe, a, an error unknown. Which I couldn't actually test that because I couldn't come up with a reason, I couldn't test that code path because I couldn't come up with a reason why it would f fail that we aren't accounting for. So to take a quick look at one of these macros, the table not found macro, we're simply uh, calling the ets.insert or whatever, whatever we're wrapping in this. In the case of an argument error, we check and say, you know, give me the information on this table and that will return undefined if the table doesn't exist. If that's the case, we return error not table not found. Otherwise, we re-raise and the next, the next macro will take a look and see if uh, it's the cause of this. Uh, another one is the catch write protected. So in the case of an argument error, we'll say, you know, is this table public or am I calling this function from the owning process? If that's the case, then it's not a, it's not a write protection issue. We'll p pass that on up. Otherwise, we are in a write protection state and we'll return that error. So that's the Elixir, that's the Elixir wrapper for ETS. It's available on GitHub, Hex, uh, currently version 080. And 